<clears throat> In the uh, liturgical calendar of the Roman Catholic Church, this, su- this Sunday is celebrated as the Feast of Christ the King. Now, this was a fairly recent addition to the Roman Catholic feasts, having been instituted by Pope Pius XI only in uh, 1925. Now, what this feast is intended to celebrate or supposed to celebrate is the reality of the dominion of Jesus Christ over the whole cosmos, over the whole universe, and for this reason, uh, it became celebrated even by non-Roman Catholics, uh, some Protestants and Lutheran churches as well. Uh, But the roots of these feasts, we must understand, was the attempts, at least partly, to reaffirm the false Roman Catholic doctrine of the temporal power of the popes. So the temporal power of the popes is the idea that the popes, the papacy, have uh, rights over territories or uh, state governments, uh, and this is distinct from their uh, church and spiritual jurisdiction. They can exercise power uh, and uh, th- that are uh, related to politics and uh, military. And this confusion of the kingdom of Christ, the spiritual kingdom of Christ, with the political kingdoms of this world, we know in history, has always led to tragic consequences. And that is a good introduction for what we are going to look at in our Bible passage this afternoon. We are going to look at a similar confusion on the part of the disciples to mistake the spiritual kingship, the spiritual dominion of Jesus Christ as the promised Messiah with a political one. And it is... Uh, of a tragic consequence. So I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14. We will be reading verses 43 to 50. So we are continuing on our series on the Gospel of Mark, and we have read the counterpart of this in the Gospel of John earlier, but this is Mark's account. Mark 14, verses 43 to uh, 50. It says, And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, He went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servants of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple, teaching and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. So this is the word of the Lord. So the passage that we have read narrates for us the familiar narrative, the familiar story of Jesus' betrayal by Judas, which led to the arrest of our Lord in the hands of this temple police, these temple officials. Now, this is an important passage in the Gospel of Mark because this is a transitional passage uh, in his Gospel. It shifts from Jesus being in the preceding narratives in most of the uh, earlier portions. uh, We find Jesus being in the company of his friends, in the company of his disciples. And then after this event, Jesus is now going to become at the hands of his opponents, his foes. It transitions from Jesus being the active mover, the main actor in the narrative, to him becoming apparently uh, passive with actions being done to him rather than him uh, being the 
active uh, mover in the narrative. Now, this transition uh, that we find in our passage makes it now irreversibly certain that, at least in the eyes of the disciples, that Jesus is in fact headed to Calvary, that His path is indeed towards suffering and towards the cross, just as He has said in the preceding uh, chapters. And this is why, in spite of the confident assertions of the disciples earlier uh, that their loyalty to Christ is shatterproof, that it is indestructible, that not even death would make them uh, deny and uh, turn their backs away from the Lord Jesus Christ, we find the depressing notes in the end of this narrative in verse 50. And they all left him and fled, meaning they all turned their backs to the Lord Jesus Christ, having now seen that Jesus Christ is indeed certainly intending to, to, the, to, to take the path of the cross. And brethren, I believe that this bears a critical lesson for us, or critical lessons on discipleship, on following the Lord Jesus Christ. For this text answers for us the question, what makes a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ fall away? What makes a Christian turn away from the Lord Jesus Christ? And the message that I want to take from here is this. Failure in Christian discipleship results from the failure of faith in the words and work of Christ. Kapag tayo ay pumapalya bilang mga mananampalataya o mga disipulo ni Heso Kristo, ito ay karaniwang pagpalya ng pananampalataya pananampalataya sa salita, mga salita at gawa ng Panginoong Heso Kristo. Again, failure in Christian discipleship results from the failure of faith in the words and work of Jesus Christ. Remember that Mark's Gospel, Mark is here writing primarily to Christians who are living in Rome uh, under the Roman Empire and they are suffering fierce persecution and they are at the peril of turning away to just denying Christ, to, the, to just deserting this whole uh, Christian faith altogether just to escape the hardships and persecutions that are associated with this faith. Now, here, the intention of Mark is to provide both an encouragement and a warning in order to propel believers to perseverance and perhaps that is you brother and sister in Christ perhaps this is what you need uh, in, in this time of crisis and here in our passage we find two demonstrations of such failure of faith which usually leads to falling away and the first of that is false expectation. The second is fear of persecution. These are usually the, uh, the uh, expressions, the demonstrations of such failure of faith in discipleship. False expectation and fear of persecution. So let us consider the first one. False expectation. You find this in the narrative. You see, what occasioned what caused the disciples turning away from the Lord Jesus Christ, leaving the Lord Jesus Christ was their failure to truly accept, to truly embrace in faithful submission the words of the Lord Jesus Christ about the necessity of His suffering, about the necessity of the path of the cross, and what the disciples did instead even up to this point was to insist rather on their own ideas of their own carnal conceptions of what Christ is supposed to be about who is the Messiah supposed to be and what following him is supposed to entail so meaning the disciples were still insisting on their own conception of who Jesus is supposed to be and this has 
an implication on what they think following Jesus Christ means. The disciples, we know, had the false view of Jesus that He is a revolutionary Messiah who is going to take up arms in rebellion against their political captor, against Rome. And this is something that Jesus Christ repeatedly distanced Himself about, that He is not the kind of that kind of Messiah. Uh, and uh, that, but in spite of that, this is still what the disciples clinged on. This is the case even with Judas who betrayed Jesus. You find that in the text, he brought an armed crowd. He brought an, a, a, a little army in order to arrest Jesus, meaning he was expecting that Jesus would resist the cross, that Jesus would resist the path of suffering, but rather, but, but that, uh, but, uh, but that he would initiate a rebellion against the Roman Empire. And then this is the case also with Peter. Although in the, in the narrative of Mark, Peter was not named, but in John, we are told that it was Peter who drew up his sword and cut off the ear of one of the servants in the temple, meaning he was expecting that Jesus would resist the cross, resist the sufferings. And this is not due to Jesus' obscurity. This is not due to Jesus' failure to repeatedly instruct them. For we know that many times Jesus told them that the Son of Man is going to suffer many things in the hands of the temple leaders and he is going to be killed. So he was clear about what kind of Messiah he is going to be. He is going to be a suffering Messiah, a Messiah with a cross. And this is what the disciples refused to hear. And so what happened is that it had an implication on their discipleship, for they also became blinded to the following statement of Jesus, that the Son of Man will suffer Therefore, he said, if anyone would come after me, he must take up his cross and follow me. Because they rejected a suffering Messiah. They did not want a suffering discipleship. But here now, they see in, the, in what is happening in our texts, the disciples now have the unmistakable confirmation that the cross is Jesus' path. For He is not resisting. He is not resisting the betrayal. He is not resisting the arrest. He is giving up Himself in the hands of Judas, in, in, the, in the hands of this, uh, this temple opponents. And so what happened to the disciples after receiving this unmistakable confirmation that Jesus is a Christ with a cross. Their pledges of indestructible loyalty became shattered. They all fled away and they left Him. What can we learn from here as a lesson of discipleship? A stubborn insistence on our own carnal understanding of Christ blurs our view on the nature of true Christian discipleship. Kapag nagpupumili tayo sa ating kaisipan kung sino ba dapat si Yeso Kristo, ito'y bubulag sa atin kung ano ba talaga ang kahulugan ng maging tagasunod ni Jesus. We will fail to become faithful followers of our Lord if we do not truly and genuinely embrace His words that following Him entails a cross. Perhaps we are like the disciples here in our text who keep hearing over and over again that the, that the Christian life involves suffering, that the Christian life involves trials, that the Christian life involves a cross, that the Christian life involves mortification. 
And perhaps you affirm that because it is part of your Christian culture, church culture as a, as a reformed who, uh, to affirm the realities of suffering because this is in the Bible. But in spite of that, at the back of your mind, you still, you still play around this fantasy, this illusion that it's going to be a smooth road for you in the future, that nothing, nothing, uh, nothing shattering is going to happen in your Christian journey. But that is, brethren, the road to a great fall because you are having false expectations of what the Christian life is going to be about, of what following Jesus is supposed to be like. And why is that? Because periods would come, like what is happening in the text that we have read, in the narrative that we read. This kind of periods in our life will come. These are periods of disciple, decisive discipleship, meaning something will, may happen in our life and it will be a transition. It will call us to become decisive whether or not we will follow the Lord Jesus Christ or we will turn away. It is those periods where a cross, just like the disciples here, a cross is going to be placed before you. And you would have to be forced to make a choice whether to pick it up and follow Jesus or turn back, desert Him. Perhaps it is a trial in your life that would make you question the ways of God or a sacrifice that you would have to make as a follower of Jesus or a temptation that you would have to painfully resist. Those kinds of crosses going to come the, the, before you and you would have to choose whether to pick it up or to turn away. This is what even the Apostle Paul asserts that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, Paul says, will suffer. Therefore, we must be strong in faith so that we do not fall. You know, when people are thrust into activities or jobs that they did not expect uh, is going to be hard, they would usually utter the words, I did not sign up for this. This is not what I signed up for. We should not have that in, the, in our Christian life when trials come. Review your baptism. When you publicly pledged to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in your baptism, you know that you were, Im you, you were immersed in water as a symbol of your union in the death of Christ. Meaning you accepted a cross in following Jesus. So I want to challenge you, brothers and, Jesus, br brothers and sisters, do not buy into a Jesus without a cross. For it is not the Jesus of Scripture. Paul said that I have decided, he, he told the Corinthian believers, I have decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Jesus is with a cross. So I challenge you to spare yourself from those kinds of poisonous so-called Christian preaching that says, when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, He will fix all your problems. He will fix all your troubles in life. It is not true. It is not the kind of Jesus being shown to us in the scriptures. In fact, it is most it, the, the most likely circumstance is that He may even add to your troubles. That is what we have here. So do not allow yourself to be tickled in your ears with the promises of only health, 
health, wealth, and prosperity supposed as a promise from Jesus. And when you hear the advice, don't take that mortification of sin too seriously. Indulge, indulge yourself a little with sin. Shun away those kinds of advice and take the words of Jesus seriously. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. This is the words that you would hear. You should hear the words of Jesus. You see, early this month, you've, you may have read of the report of Tim Chalice about the sudden, very sudden death of his son. His son is healthy with a great future ahead, with a fiancé in fact, and in a seminary, uh, perhaps uh, intending to go to the ministry, and then he just drops unconscious, and he never regained his consciousness so suddenly. And Tim Chalice said that they were initially asking, why? What purpose? What reason? This is apparently random, senseless. What would you do if those, th time, those kind of times come into your life? What have you been expecting in the Christian life? Jesus comes with a cross. So that is the first thing that made the disciples fall in our text. They had false expectations. But aside from that, they have a fear of persecution. You also find that in our text, the disciples had that stubborn refusal to accept the reality of the cross. They didn't want the cross. They didn't want the the, a, a Christ with the cross and now this is so obvious that this is not the kind of Jesus, they, the, the kind of Christ that they want uh, because they reject the reality of the cross. It blinded them also to the promise of resurrection. And this was a perspective, a perspective that there is a coming resurrection uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ and for those who are going to be united with Him, this was what they needed to overcome the fear of men's persecution. You find that in Mark, in Mark 8, chapter 31, when Jesus first explicitly told His disciples that the Son of Man is going to suffer and be killed, it, is not, it did not stop there. It is immediately followed by and after three days, rise again. Meaning he is not going to stay dead. He is not going to remain in the grave. But that after three days, he will rise up again. And just before Gethsemane, when Jesus predicted that his disciples will all fall away. Because God will strike the shepherd as promised in Zechariah 13. We, we read earlier. God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. In Mark 14, verse 28, it is followed with a certain assertion, but after I am raised up, I will meet you in Galilee. But because they are so blinded by their rejection of the cross, they also did not see that there is a promise of resurrection. The cross comes with a promise of a crown. And we know, we know later in Acts that this reality of Jesus' resurrection after the disciples have finally witnessed that Jesus Christ indeed is not going to stay dead, that He will rise up again on the third day. And after it all happened, just as Jesus told, this defeated band of Jesus' followers who all fled away in following Him would become those people who would stand before the Jewish leaders, the Roman, le Roman leaders, and testify to the Lord Jesus Christ in spite of the threats of persecution. 
they were able to do that now in the book of Acts particularly because they found that Jesus indeed rose from the dead. These bands of followers who cowered in fear and ran away from the threats of persecution is going to be that small group in the book of Acts who is going to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ in spite of the threats of martyrdom and would turn the world upside down. But humanly speaking, had they believed Jesus' words right up the beginning, of course, that is not the sovereign arrangement of God, but had they believed Jesus' words in terms of human responsibility, had they believed Jesus' words right up the beginning, that Jesus Christ is going to the cross, but He's going to rise up from the dead, they might have had the courage to stand in faithful discipleship rather than flee and desert the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, what lesson of discipleship can we take from this? The death surpassing hope offered in Jesus' resurrection encourages faithful Christian living and Christian suffering. Ibig sabihin, yung pag-asa na lagpas pa sa kamatayan, ito yung nagpapalakas sa isang mana ng palataya upang maging matapat sa kabila ng mga kahirapan bilang isang Kristiyano. You remember, Paul's words in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if Christ is not raised from the dead then Christians of all people are most to be pitied pinakakaawa-awang tao tayo dahil umasa tayo sa wala naghirap tayo para sa wala Paul said that in 1 Corinthians 15. We are pitiful creatures without the resurrection. If resurrection is denied, either of Jesus Christ or, or, or our future resurrection when He comes again in glory, we are most to be pitied because that means all we had is the cross without the crown. And we pick up the cross for nothing. But Jesus as Paul proclaimed, was raised indeed from the dead. And therefore, we have the ultimate incentive to become steadfast and immovable and always abounding in the work of the Lord. We know that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is going to be revealed and given for us. We know that this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. We know that if we bear the cross, we will wear the crown. And that keeps us going as Christians in spite of of our many troubles. Therefore, we do not fear men. We do not fear what man can do. For at worst, they can only kill the body. But they cannot kill the soul, as Jesus said elsewhere. But we fear Him who is able to raise up our bodies from the dead and do with it as He please. Therefore, if I, I said earlier, do not buy into a Jesus without the cross, then do not buy also into a Jesus without a crown. He is crowned as Lord of all. And therefore, we, have a, we, some, we, we, we can rest ourselves secure that He is in dominion. Do not accept a Jesus without a crown. Do not accept a Jesus whose benefit is only as far as what this world could, could offer. Just like the disciples here, they, they, 
For them, the only crown that Jesus could wear is the crown uh, of the, uh, 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 a political crown rather than, uh, than the crown of being the king of the universe who is making all things new in redemption. Therefore, when they saw that Jesus is not going to wear that political crown, they deserted him. So do not accept a Jesus whose benefit is only for this world or otherwise you would fall. You will fall. For when troubles come and threaten your worldly security, a Jesus without an otherworldly promise is going to fail you. But the Jesus of Scripture promises us a resurrection and a future better world. The Christ of the Word promises a sure reward for those who would faithfully follow Him. And it lies beyond this life. And it is, it is only such a hope that could sustain a Christian in faithful following in spite of troubles. You know, the story of J Johnny Erickson Tada when she had that tragic accident in her life at her teenage years. She was quite an athletic woman and had a bright future of, uh, in, in her athletic career. But because of a diving accident, she was left a quadriplegic for the rest of her life, never going to be able to move parts of her body neck down. What could sustain her to live in such a dire circumstance? It was her knowledge in her own words, her knowledge that there is going to be a future resurrection. And it's what kept her going it's what kept her useful in facts in reaching out to those who had also become victims of, of such kind of accidents. And she held on to that hope in her words that one day, at that day when Christ comes again, she said, she will be on her feet dancing. It's what kept her going. So immerse your mind, brothers and sisters, with thoughts of your future glory as an antidote to despair in times of suffering. And I extend this invitation to you who are still not followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this invitation is being given to you now to follow Christ, to become His disciple, to enjoy the blessing of knowing that your sins are forgiven, to, 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 to know that uh, you have eternal life in Christ Jesus for having Him as your Savior, as your Redeemer, and as your Lord. But make no mistake, friends, it comes with a cross. This is not the good life that people are speaking about when they think of the good life. The Christian life comes with a cross. It comes with forsaking your sin uh, at the outset, at the very beginning. It comes with denying yourself. But there is a promise of a crown a promise of future glory that is even now prepared for you and that you will receive when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again in glory. So I encourage you to be a disciple of Jesus Christ now and to forsake your sins now and to forsake your self-reliance now and trust in the saving words and work of Jesus Christ. May you heed that challenge. For us, brethren, when we look at this text, we see a gloomy situation of the disciples fleeing away from Jesus. But it is a great comfort 
to know that this story of the disciples does not end here. This is not the end. What we have in the passage is only part of the story where Jesus in His grace has promised even before this happened that He is going to restore them and in fact further purify them so that they would become better disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ after perhaps you had those failures of faith that I have, I have spoken about. You had become disillusioned because of your false ex expectations of what, of what Christian life is supposed to be. You cowered at the face of persecution and you were, you were not faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. But, but, as, but uh, this text is showing to us that that does not have to be the end of your Christian life. That there is a promise of grace. There is a promise of restoration. So my brother, my sister, do not delay. If you had failed the Lord Jesus Christ, you can come back to Him and expect His grace and His mercy to shower upon you. For He will not cast out those who faithfully come to Him. And may you heed that call. Let us close in prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you for the reminders of your word, the challenge of your word on how we may faithfully follow the Lord Jesus Christ as those who had pledged to follow him indeed. We thank you that we have such a great Savior who bore the cross for us and, he, and who rose again after the third day and is now seated as the only Savior of mankind. And we pray that uh, you would help us indeed to become faithful followers, to also pick up the crosses daily that you bring upon us, uh, and so that as we do so, we can cherish our fellowship in his sufferings so that we would also have fellowship in his glory and resurrection. We also pray for those who are still outside of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would use what they have heard now uh, in order to confront them with the gospel. May they embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as Lord indeed and as Savior. And may they find forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. So we commit this to you. Bless us, we pray, and glorify yourself, for we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.